Hello, my name is David Meeks from Pat Bar. We're going to spend some time this morning, approximately 10 minutes, to help you understand how you would qualify to take the Patent Bar exam. Since it's a short program, we're going to go directly to our slides. And we want to provide you a link to the General Requirements Bulletin, which you should read and be familiar with, because this is really the only asset that reviews all the requirements for qualifying for the Patent Bar exam. Additionally, we've provided the phone number of the Office of Enrollment and Discipline. We do recommend that if you do place a call, that when you get somebody on the line to ask to speak to a staff attorney, which will be more beneficial than uh, speaking to other people that might answer the phone. Now, qualifying relates to three different relevant areas. One is your status in the U.S., the second is your science or technical background, and the third is moral character and reputation. And relating to your status in the U.S., one, you may be a citizen. If you are, you qualify, at least under this part. If you are a permanent resident, you qualify, that is with a green card. And your status may be an alien residing in the U.S., which would be a person that holds a visa to be in this country. Now, a visas, there's usually uh, two that would be involved. One is an F-1, which is a foreign student visa, and the other is an H-1B, which is a temporary work visa. And I'm going to discuss these two at the very end. And we know there are some people that are, that are here viewing our program that are on visas, which we will discuss at the end of our program. Now, Canada is a special exception because we have a reciprocity provision with Canada whereby a Canadian patent attorney or agent may take the patent bar exam in the United States and in so doing can represent applicants that are located in Canada. So if you're Canadian, that's a applicable reciprocity provision. Now, the second status is your science or technical background. And there's three categories that you can apply under, A, B, and C. And we're going to look at each one of these three categories. Category A is where you have a bachelor's degree that was awarded by a U.S. college or university, an accredited U.S. college or university, or you have an equivalent bachelor's degree that was awarded by a foreign university. And there's 32 degrees. The next slide is the first 16 degrees. And I don't expect you to necessarily go over those, but they're all listed in the registration bulletin. Starts off with biology. And then there's 16 more degrees. And the very last one is petroleum engineering. So again, they're all listed in the general requirements bulletin. Now, under category B, you still must have a bachelor's degree. For example, it could be a, in business, but you must have the coursework that would be equivalent to a subject listed in category A. For example, if you had a minor in biology, you may have taken enough courses in biology to qualify under this category. You can also take courses at a community college. Now, these should be courses that would be transferable to a four-year college or university, and they would be courses that would go towards a degree in a science or technical subject. Now, Category B has four options. Option one would be 24 semester hours in physics, and these would be physics courses for physics majors. In fact, all of the courses that we are referring to are always science or engineering courses for majors in science or engineering. Now, option two is 32 semester hours in a combination, the first being either eight semester hours of chemistry or eight semester hours of physics. And these are basically two sequential courses. And sequential means that the two courses together cover the entire category, either chemistry or physics. It's not the timing, it's that the content together make up and cover the entire field. And that's the curriculum for the basic courses in both chemistry or physics. And these have to be the courses that are for science or engineering majors, and these courses must include a, a lab. And then along with those eight credits, you need 24 more semester hours in biology, botany, microbiology, or molecular biology.
Now, option three is 30 semester hours in chemistry. And again, only chemistry courses for chemistry majors would qualify under this option. Now, option four is the broadest category, and it requires 40 semester hours. And again, we have a combination, the first part of which is eight semester hours of chemistry or eight semester hours of physics. And again, these are two sequential courses, and they're for science or engineering majors, and they include a lab. Along with those, you also require 32 semester hours of chemistry, physics, biology, botany, microbiology, molecular biology, engineering, and possibly computer science. Now, under category B, you would be supplying additional documentation along with your application. And these fall broadly into a category called official course descriptions. And all of these courses, you must have received a grade of C minus or better. These copies, you'll be submitting copies, all come from the college catalog during the year that you took the course. Say it was a biology course in like the school year 2000 to 2001, that would be the college catalog where you would make copies and including a copy of the cover page showing that you had that catalog available to you. Also, the pages describing the requirements for the degree. For example, if you were taking a biology course, you would have the pages in the, in the catalog that describe the requirements for a biology degree. Also, for the courses that you're going to use and have evaluated to qualify, the pages that describe those courses. Now, along with that, the application also requires a certain amount of highlighting. One is, if it's a course you want them to evaluate, then you would highlight it on your transcript and also in the course descriptions. Now, I want to make this perfectly clear that if you don't have the college catalog from the years that you need, the registrar at your college or university will have those. And you can contact them, you can tell them what your requirements are, and they can make the copies for you. So this is not really a difficult problem whatsoever. Now, as far as these courses under category B, one thing is that if your courses were taken on a basis of quarter hours or there were trimesters, then you multiply your college credits by two thirds. Also, if any of the documentation is in a foreign language, you also have to file certified English translations. And if you have an educational program or educational credits completed outside of the U.S., that is in foreign colleges or universities, the Office of Enrollment and Discipline may ask that you supply documentation relating to the equivalency of those programs with a similar program in the U.S. And one place you can find information about that is the Council for Higher Education Accreditation. Now under category C, this allows you to qualify by taking the fundamentals of engineering test. And any person can take that exam in at least New Hampshire and Michigan. There may be other states. And we've given you there a link to a place where they provide prep courses. But I would like to say that these exams are for engineering students or engineers. They are not easy to pass and they are very difficult for a non-engineer. Now, anytime you're qualifying under either A, B, or C, you have to submit a transcript. Under every category, you require a transcript. And it must be an official original transcript, which includes either a stamp or a seal. And you may submit that yourself, or the college or university may require that they submit that to the Office of Enrollment and Discipline directly. So whichever way it goes, it makes no difference. Now, as far as character or reputation, a couple of main areas here. One is if you have been convicted of a felony or any crime involving moral turpitude or breach of trust. Also, if you are a disciplined professional or, for example, you've been disbarred. And there are a number of questions that relate to these topics in the application. These are questions 15 through 22. So you should go over those questions. The main idea is that some people will not qualify on this basis. And two, that many people will qualify even if they've had some minor interaction with the authorities in some way, like traffic tickets will generally not prevent you from qualifying. So now we're at our last slide, and this is where we have a foreigner who comes to the U.S. on a visa. 
which would be an F-1 visa, and it would be generally a student that comes to attend either law school or to get an advanced technical degree, or it may be a foreign attorney that comes to the U.S. to get an LLM degree in law. So there's a number of categories. Now, they all would have an F-1 visa. You cannot take the exam with an F-1 visa. You cannot do that. Now, after completing your degree, there is a, a period of practical work experience. So you can come to the U.S., take the degree, graduate, and then work for a year. And that period is extendable for three years. So you can actually be here for that whole time period for the degree plus another four years. But you can never take the patent bar exam during those years because at all times you're on an F-1 visa. However, at the point where the F-1 visa is going to expire, hopefully your employer has obtained an H-1B, which is a temporary work visa. With that visa, if it includes a provision that you plan to procure patents on behalf of your employer, on that basis you can take the patent bar. So that's where this all leads. You come, you get your degree, you can work for up to four years. You never take the patent bar, but you're doing patent work. Your employer gets you an H-1B visa, and with that visa, you can take the patent bar. So that completes our program. Thanks for watching our video.